Um, Steve and I go back uh, a lot of years. He's a good friend, a personal friend. We've worked together. Uh, 40 going to his 46th year in the industry, 35 as a consultant, and uh, highly respected from one coast to the other, north to south. So, Steve, I appreciate you coming and uh, looking forward to hearing what you got to say. Well, John, thanks for the kind words. And uh, it has been, I think you and I have known each other. It's got to be close to 35 years or something like that. Right. But um, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Murray. I'm with Real Trends Consulting. We're based in Denver, Colorado. Um, for 35, 36 years, for those who don't know us, Real Trends produced trends reports, research reports, uh, did rankings of brokerage companies and agents and teams, uh, do a lot of consulting work for brokerage companies, gather a lot of data. Um, in those 35 years, uh, for instance, we've done over 3,400 valuations of residential brokerage companies, all brands, all models, virtually every state. Um, and we collect the data and, and we do consulting work. What I want to share today for broker owners and managers is a couple observations. Uh, I don't, uh, we can, and we'll save time for questions and answers. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on just what's going on in the market because you'll know that better than I will. Uh, I will tell you that your peers around the country uh, we've just gotten some initial reports in, and as you might expect, unit sales are off measurably in the first quarter, mainly due to the lack of homes to sell. It is, it is uh, uh, that, that problem, which has been coming on for years now, is really critical now. I know in Denver, they're celebrating the fact that we just bounced all the way up to almost 2,000 listings at the end of March. That's in a metropolitan area of 3 million people. There's, there's basically nothing there. So let's go by that. We all, I'm sure Western New York, you have the same problems going on and, and increasing prices. So for broker owners and managers, I like to address things this way. Um, this is not a complicated business. Uh, there are three things an effective broker owner or office manager needs to do to be successful. One, you have to recruit talent. Number two, you have to develop that talent or support that talent. And number three, you have to do those things while making sure to spend less money than you have coming in, kind of a simple equation. And it sounds simple, and it is, that's it. Those are the three things. Execution of those three things is where the challenges are. Um, we're gonna be producing a special research report later this spring, early summer, which is basically a 10 year review of the top 750 brokerage companies in the country for whom we have data. And to talk about how difficult the execution is, I can share this with you. Um, the initial look at that data, out of the 750 largest brokers in the country, barely half of them recruited as many net new agents as the overall realtor population grew in that 10 year period. So only half of the top largest 750 firms in the country added to their agent ranks as fast as the number of realtors grew in the US. You look at another piece of data and you say, out of that top 750, barely a third, one third, of the 750 largest firms in the country grew their transaction count as fast as the national transaction count grew. So here are the purportedly 700 biggest best brokerage companies in the country 
only half of them grew their agent count as much as the total population of agents grew, and only a third grew their transactions uh, as over the last 10 years as much as the national market did. So it points to the fact that while what you have to do as a broker owner to be successful is not complicated, executing a strategy to do that is another thing when you consider those facts. It is interesting note, however, uh, and we noted this from 2020 and 2021 results, and it was really surprising in a manner of speaking. Before 2020, the Real Trends 500, which is the 500 largest brokerage companies in the country, prior to 2020, the best year that group had had, they grew their national market share collectively by 0.3%. That was the best performance prior to 2020. Then suddenly in 2020 and 2021, they grew in 2020, they grew their market share three and a half percent or almost 12 times their previous best year. Then in 2021, they grew their market share another 2.7%, which again is an enormous outcome. When I look at and consider what took place in 2020 and 2021, it gives us a few clues as to what happened in 2020 and 2021 that was so different than anything that had ever happened before to cause that to happen. Now you take away some of the influence of the growth of firms like Compass and EXP, uh, a few firms like Fathom and United Real Estate, which certainly shifted some of the business, although their growth mainly came out of other Real Trends 500 companies. The one thing I can tell you that changed most, particularly in 2021, is managers and broker owners spent a whole lot more time via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meeting or whatever. Broker owners and managers spent a whole lot more time communicating with their agents and their staff than had ever been the case before at all. And, and I, I can say that also because from about mid-March of 2020 till mid-June of 2020, uh, I was probably on three to four Zoom calls a day on average with agents and managers and staff of client brokers of ours. And we were just one source of information that broker owners used. Where I'm going with this is, I, and among all the things that were different in 2020 and 2021, putting aside the market surge that everyone had, the one thing that broker owners, managers, and leaders did differently than they had done before is they actually spent a lot of time interacting with their agents and staff, much more than they had ever done so before. And that gives us a clue to what causes success in brokerage offices and companies, which is that constant interaction and relationship building between the leaders of a brokerage company and the agents and staff of a brokerage company. There's, I really, I looked at the impact of you know, technology, how much new technology did brokers bring, put in place in 2020, 2021. We looked at consolidation of losses. We, we looked at a lot of factors. The one thing that was different was the level of interaction. And so the first thing I would share you got these three things you have to do to be successful. You have to recruit effectively talent. You have to develop and support that talent. And lastly, spend less money than you have coming in. Recruiting and retaining and developing your agents particularly is a matter of constant, ongoing, useful interaction. Period. 
And so the first thing I would share is if you are trying to build a good brokerage organization, you have to commit yourself to ongoing continuous contact and communication with agents, both inside and outside of your company, because that communication and relationship building outside your company is what causes effective recruiting of talent. There's no question about it. We have, we have studied brokerage companies that are effective recruiting, obviously part of this special research report. We looked at the 50 top performing brokers of the last 10 years. What did they do? Where did they spend their time, money, and effort? Or we might call it the time, talent, and treasure where did they spend it? And over and over and over again, what we read, what we hear when we're surveying and interviewing people is how much time leaders of effective brokerage companies spend interacting with agents, whether it's to recruit those agents to their firm or to retain and develop them when they're already with their company. It's, it's, just bottom line. One other thing on that, in that area, um, we hear from brokerage clients all the time, I'm sure it's hitting you, it always has, it always will, is all the new forms of low-cost brokerage firms, whether it's EXP or Fathom. 20 years ago, it was Keller Williams. 40 years ago, it was Remax. We've, we've, we've always had this in my 40, almost 46 years now, there have always been new kinds of lower cost brokerage operations to entice agents with, oh, we do all the things the first full service guys do. We just charge you a lot less. And that's been going on virtually as long as I've been in the industry. But this much is very true. A couple things. First of all, I want you to think about the fact that if it were always and only about the monetary relationship between a broker and agents, everybody on this call would be out of business. Because there's always been lower cost brokerage companies, always, as long as I've been in the industry. Are there more of them today than yesterday? Yes. Are there more that are well funded, that are Definitely lower cost, more virtual brokerage. Yes, not going to not going to debate that. But they've always been there. Always, always have been there. My entire career, Remax people forget has been around since 1973. They became a national real estate company truly in the early to mid 80s is when they had their breakout. Keller Williams, you might construe as a lower cost brokerage because they have a cap. And Keller Williams has been around for, believe it or not, it's now, I think, uh, Chuck, it's, this will be 35 years this year, 1987, I think is the founding year of Keller Williams in Texas. So it's not like these are new companies. They've been around forever. EXP has been around 10 years. Compass has been around almost 10 years. Fathom has been around eight years. United Real Estate has been around eight years. They're expanding and they're more prevalent, but they've always been there or, or those like them. I mean, I, I chuckle with people re reminding them that in terms of discount brokerage companies, everybody's kind of chattering about that now. I said, well, let's see, help you sell was launched in 1977. And Assist to Sell was 1987. And Zip Realty, the original online discount brokerage was 1997. So now I don't know that they're in Western New York, but Redfin has now been around, believe it or not, almost 15 years, 2007 is when Redfin was launched. Interesting enough, the same year that Zillow, I think Zillow may have been 06, but they've been around that long. So we have all of this. 
what has changed with given all of those things is there are more offerings to agents, both new agents, low producing agents and high producing agents. There are just more options for them than there ever have been. Um, it makes the competition tougher. But interesting enough, when I look at those, that 10 year growth um, report, the, the data, the results, uh, there are Keller Williams firms that are in the top 50, Remax, ERA, Better Homes and Gardens, Caldwell Banker, Century 21, Independence, and they are from every region of the country. So clearly, Firms of all makes and models, more traditional incumbent firms, have found a way to compete in their markets and to grow their agents and to grow their production and even grow their productivity. So there has to be something other than brand or location or region or model that accounts for that. And that's the kind of report we're going to produce and the research we're doing, but so far, <laughs> What I keep reading from the results of the surveys we did of the top firms in each category is that the people that are achieving results in recruiting and growth and production and agent productivity and all those fundamentals is that they actually spend a lot more time, number one, they have a focused plan, number two, to produce those results. So success in brokerage it is kind of what we say is not, it's not by osmosis. It starts with having a dedicated plan and execution of that plan and the investment of a lot of time and resource into recruiting and developing people and figuring out a way to keep your cost as low as you can to produce those kind of results. Um, those are some of the things in the basic brokerage business of one share. There are, um, we wrote a report, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's been um, almost 20 years ago. But in late 2002 and early 2003, the National Association of Realtors uh, hired Realtrends to write a report on the future of the brokerage industry. And we spent about two months doing the research and homework, and it resulted in a report that was entitled From Homogeneity to Segmentation. I think we thought it would have, was going to happen faster, but ultimately it is happened. What do we mean by that? Going back to my one of my basic statements earlier is that there are a multitude of options available to agents from very low cost, you know, $100 a month and $200 a transaction up to full service brokerages that may, may, may have a graduated commission plan with or without a cap and a whole box of different services. But interesting enough, what we note as as that segmentation is happening, we're seeing these really strong companies emerge of all different kinds. Again, the top performers. You know, how do you explain, for instance, there's a firm out here in Colorado in Fort Collins called The Group. The Group is far and away the most expensive brokerage company for an agent in Northern Colorado. And yet today, with around 200 agents, they are not only the largest firm in Northern Colorado, that would be Loveland, Fort Collins, Greeley area. They are the largest, not in terms of number of agents, but in terms of closed transactions, they're number one. In terms of agent productivity, they're number one. In terms of market share, they're number one. And yet they're, they're the most expensive brokerage company by double, if not more, in that, in that marketplace. What do they do that's special? They are a uniquely 
high accountability brokerage company. They have minimum standards. They have as close as you can get to required training as you can get without violating independent contractor agreements. Um, they have absolute accountability from office managers and staff with the agents. They have and do more in terms of training and development of their agents than any brokerage I'm aware of. So it's just this heavy, intense interaction with their agents and, and accountability that we're here to be full-time real estate professionals. If you're not gonna be a full-time real estate professional, this is not the place to be. There's, there's another firm like that in Reading, Pennsylvania, that's a Remax company called Remax of Reading. Number one market share, number one in agent productivity, not number one in agent count, but high accountability. What are those two leaders groups or leadership, ownership, leadership groups have in common is that they don't and haven't set as their top goal to be the largest firm in their market. They just turned out that way, but rather that they will run a productive, profitable, growing brokerage enterprise. Um, on the other hand, I can tell you in the state of Colorado, the largest firm in the state of Colorado in terms of number of agents is HomeSmart. They're also probably the lowest cost brokerage company in Colorado. I mean, generally speaking, they are profitable. They are growing. I mean, I think last I checked, I think they have 24 to 2,600 agents in Colorado. Their average agent productivity is probably under four transactions per agent. To put that in perspective, the group Inc. in Fort Collins is probably closer to 26 transactions. Big, big difference. Both are successful, both are growing, both are profitable. Or my point being is for a broker owner today, it's more a matter of choosing what model do I want to operate that fits what I want to do? Because being just a generalist, um, as, I, as I point out, and we'll probably reiterate in our report, to, to put it kind of simply, um, you can be a Nordstrom's or you can be a Walmart but don't try to be a J.C. Penney's and Sears. Because you may have noticed, I'm not sure what's going on in Western New York, but people like Kohl's and Sears and Penny's, who are kind of these middle of the road department stores, they're basically either already have disappeared from most places in the U.S., but they're, if they haven't already, they're going that direction. There's no distinctiveness of what they offer people. And it, it, it's funny, um, um, I comment to a lot of folks that, you know, what's true for a lot of people is there are things I'll go to Walmart for or Sam's Club or Costco. And then there are other things that I will do to go to a Nordstrom's or I'll go to some higher end store. But the truth is, I don't think I've been in a Sears, Penny, or Kohl store for 20 years. But I'll shop at Walmart and Nordstrom's, different things. I think it's funny, in the past 20, 15, or 20 years, Walmart, two or three different times, attempted to, believe it or not, they spent billions of dollars to go more upscale with their fashion, their clothing. Is there anybody on this Zoom call that goes to Walmart for fashion? Not, not, doesn't really happen. Um, and Walmart lost billions and billions of dollars trying it and finally said, you know what? Nobody goes to Walmart for fashion. 
So for brokerage companies, for an owner, uh, for an office manager, to the extent possible, you're going to try to build a, a culture and a set of services and prices or costs you're going to charge for those services that fit the kind of brokerage office or brokerage company you want to have. To the extent you try to be all things to all people, you will fail ultimately. It is a matter of saying, this is who we are. This is what we offer. Continually trying to improve that offering. Understanding, by the way, that I'm telling you some things you already know, which is that what appeals to an agent when they're new to the business will change once they're doing 3 million, 5 million, 8 million sales, their, their cost benefit analysis and calculation changes as they change their level of production or years in the business. I'll give you, a, I'll give you an insight. One of the more successful companies on the, this 10 year search I did, it was really kind of interesting, but what they shared with me what, and I won't tell you who they are because that wouldn't be appropriate to name them. But for the last eight years, they study their MLS statistics every quarter. And they built before um, Broker Metrics put it together or a company called Relytics built a tool. This brokerage had their own tool to analyze what segments of the realtor population in their market were most likely to move from one brokerage company to another. Now, this particular brokerage company did not, for instance, have a luxury division. They didn't have a relocation department. They didn't offer private offices and they weren't the lowest cost brokerage and didn't wanna be in the market. What they discovered is they had no opportunity to get luxury agents to move because they had no program. <clears throat> they didn't have private offices and they found that group, big groups of agents who were with companies offering private offices did not move much, if at all, from a company offering a private or semi-private office to one that had none. But what they did find <clears throat> is, that, is that agents who had been in the business two to three years and were doing between six and 10 transactions in their prior 12 months as a group, that particular group of people had a much higher probability of moving based on their behavior, actual activity than any other group out there. And secondly, they found within that group, they found that Agents who did not have a private office <clears throat> were much higher, like much more likely to move to a similar company, even if it cost them a little more. And lastly, they found that those kind of brokerages who offered, if they didn't have a lot of marketing and tech support, but if they had a lot of training, and educational opportunities, that that was a major cause of agents <clears throat> who were doing six to 10 transactions who wanted to move their production up. That particular brokerage, to give you an example, over the last 10 years, <clears throat> using that analysis, grew from around 150 agents to almost 750 agents in the last eight years. They grew fivefold. <clears throat> in the last eight years. By the way, that particular marketplace had approximately 11,000 realtors. When they got done with all their analysis, their real audience they found was between 400 and 500 realtors. So in their recruiting, they focused on that audience. And they deployed initially one full-time person, it has now grown to two and a half full-time people that focus only on recruiting staff and recruiting agents.
to give you an example. So it is as a broker owner, if I'm in your shoes today, I'm going to take a step back and say, who am I? What do I believe? What kind of company do I want to have? Do I want to? And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a Walmart. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be a Nordstrom's. But you need to pick where you want to be. And then you need to build a plan. And I gave you a hint. Broker metrics is a fairly common uh, data tool available to brokers today. I'm, I'm, I'm confident it's available in your marketplace. Relytics is kind of a newcomer. Very, very interesting data analytics available from, it's R-E-L-I-T-I-X. You can look them up online. Very interesting data analysis provider. And there, I'm sure there are others out there. Um, but that helps you focus your time and your talent and your resources. Who are the people most likely to be to where I would have an appealing offer to them? So that, that's just some things to share about brokerage performance. Um, one of the other things when I'm working with brokerage companies and it's something to consider is, in fact, I, I, I talked to a brand new client, some people I actually don't know until we talked yesterday, and, and they're talking about creating, uh, merging some brokerages together to create a, a bigger firm. But <clears throat> all the brokerage clients I've worked with, the first question I will ask the client to answer a question is why do you own a brokerage company? It's kind of a straight foot. And a lot of brokers that kind of, they kind of stumble when you ask them that because sometimes they've owned it five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and they want to do strategic planning. And I'll say, well, why do you own this company? And there's three answers, potential answers to that question to give you an idea. One, I'm building, I want to own a brokerage company to build equity value for future sale. I want to build equity. Two, second possible answer is I'm own, I own a brokerage company. I want to own a brokerage company to produce income apart from my listing and selling, or just I want to build it for income. And the third possible answer is I do it for personal satisfaction because I like owning a brokerage company. I like running it, leading it. I just enjoy that. I enjoy the work. <clears throat> now, the reason I pose this to those of you on the phone is the following. You can't possibly do strategic planning for your company unless you can answer that question. And by the way, most every broker has always said, well, it's a little bit of all three, and I get that. But you can't truly do strategic planning without settling on one primary reason for owning a brokerage company. Is it income? Is it equity? Or is it personal satisfaction? <clears throat> we have helped brokerage companies for a lot of years by helping them focus on answering that question, and then we can develop a strategic plan for what we're going to do. Probably the best example I can tell you is it's been now 26 years ago. I was employed by a brokerage company owned by four people a husband, wife, and two other partners. They were all in their, I think, early, mid-40s. They had 50 agents. They were in a growing metropolitan area, not one of the big ones, but a medium-sized one. <clears throat> and we answered, asked that question. All four were listing and selling and trying to run the brokerage company full-time. And we asked them the question. It took a day and a half for them to answer the question and come to a consensus which is they were really doing it to build long-term equity. So 
we then went into, okay, great, that's, that's it. That's the number one thing. So we developed a whole strategy to build long-term equity. Now, I'll shorten the story up, but we did a number of things to focus on building long-term equity. And all I will say is back then, best of my recollection, their firm probably was worth total about 800,000 to a million dollars. That was 1995. Today, that firm, the whole enterprise is probably worth 23 to 24 million dollars. And that doesn't count. That's just the operating businesses. That doesn't count the real estate they own that's owned by those same partners uh, that they use, which is itself probably worth eight to $10 million. And it started with the plan 26 years ago, say, okay, you wanna build something. You're not, if you're not worried about short-term income, then let's focus on how we're gonna generate income, but what we're going to do with that income which is to grow. Back then, there were 50 agents. Today, there are 340 agents. Back then, they had no mortgage, title, or insurance, or property management, or commercial brokerage. Now, they have all those businesses, and all of them are performing well. But it all started in 1995 with a, a focus on what is it you're trying to accomplish here. And again, again they were all fairly young people. And they had this long runway ahead of them. I have had other clients who say it's income. That's great. We're going to develop a strategy for income. And by the way, we do a, a growing and a fair amount of, of consulting with teams, agent teams. And as we've had to guide most of them to understand, most teams are income focused business or should be focused on generating income and not building something of equity because the market for teams is fairly limited in terms of what a team can get from the sale of their team business. Why is that, by the way, simply put, most teams, the great preponderance of teams, most of their business is personal sphere of influence business done by the, the leader or owner of the team but I digress. So brokerage companies, that is some input I wanted to share with you all today. Um, let me step back from that before we go to Q&A. Uh, what's going on in the marketplace? We are headed for a housing downturn. We are headed for higher interest rates. Um, there are some of us on the phone that were alive and working in the 70s. Um, I wrote a little editorial yesterday and I think I quoted Yogi Berra. It's like deja vu all over again. Um, it, it could have been Winston Churchill or a Spanish philosopher, George Santayana, who once said, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. What's been going on now, and this did not start with President Biden or President Trump or President Obama or President Bush necessarily, although we might start there. But here's in a big picture, here's what's happened to our economy. One, that the same thing happened in the 1970s. Number one, let's raise tax rates and let's increase the regulatory hurdles for businesses of all kinds. Let's just make it more difficult for production to happen, whether that's building new homes or pumping oil and gas or building autos, we just go down the line. Let's constrain supply. Now, part of that is federal and state government policies. Part of it is the pandemic exposed the weakness in global supply chains. Doesn't matter. We're in a situation where supply of goods and services is constrained. Now, 
let's go out and print $25 trillion in the last 20 years of federal deficits, $25 trillion. And let's sprinkle that pixie dust over an economy with constrained supply of goods and services. Anybody who ever took a basic economics course knows that when you constrain supply and you pump, prime the pump of demand, you're going to get inflation. And the more you print money on the one hand, and the more you constrain supply on the other hand, the more inflation you're going to get. And that's what happened in the 1970s. And in 1979, we ended up with 12% inflation, 75 to 8% unemployment. And I don't know, Chuck, you and I, and Lou Izzo, I saw was signed on the call. Were you guys in the business in the 70s? early 80s. Rosalind, I see you there. Were you in the business back then? Oh, no, because you look like you're 35. You weren't even born then. Well, what we ended up with was the chairman of the Fed under President Jimmy Carter started to raise rates to start to choke off inflation. <clears throat> and they continued that under President Reagan. Mortgage rates, I think, hit 16% by 1981. And the housing market fell by 50% from the end of 1980 until the spring of 1982. Housing unit sales fell 50%. And unemployment, as, they, as the way they measure it today, Back then, the unemployment rate hit 15%. And that's what it took to crush inflation. Now, I don't think there's any way this administration is going to go that hard. But, and I don't think that those traumatic outcomes will necessarily be the outcome. But we need to understand that if they, if they really, if the Fed and the Treasury and the White House want to get serious about killing inflation, these rates are going to have to go up more than a quarter of a point. I saw yesterday or this morning the 10-year rate hit the highest it's been in three years. And it's going to go up. And the 10-year rate has a big influence on mortgage rates. So what I think is about to happen next is unit sales will slow because of higher rates and uncertainty in the economy. <clears throat> Unfortunately for us in our industry, that's not, that may solve some of the demand problem, but mainly that's going to impact first time home buyers and low income home buyers. <clears throat> what really needs to happen, I'll go back to the last thing and then I'll take questions. This problem of supply has been coming on, been coming on since the 2007, 8, 9 downturn. What happened back then that nobody's talked about <clears throat> is the national builders of houses, both single and multifamily, they came through that in pretty good shape. But the local and regional medium and small home builders and apartment builders got wiped out. And then banking regulations more or less block them from credit to get back into the business. So for almost a decade, we saw the net number of net new households exceed housing units being built by anywhere from 300 to 500,000 households a year. Add that up over 10 years and we ended up with four to 5 million housing units short of just normal household demand. And that's where we are today. So <clears throat> with that, I will be quiet and hope that some of this was useful and worthwhile and I'll take questions. And I guess I can look in the chat, let's see. Oh, there, okay, it said, please raise your hand, ask questions. <clears throat> was, um, 
so impactful and so knowledgeable. I can't thank you enough. If anyone wants to uh, ask you a question, please raise your hand and you'll be uh, acknowledged. Who is that? Chuck? Chuck? Yep. Hey, Steve, thanks for being here. Hey, Chuck. So question, what are you seeing in the merger and acquisition world in the brokerage business today? Are you seeing an <clears throat> uptick? Or, I mean, it seems as though there's a lot of conversations around consolidations and things of that sort. It, the, market, um, the market is the most active. I have seen it <clears throat> almost in my entire 35 years of doing this kind of consulting work. Um, there are more buyers with more money for brokerage companies today than any time I remember. Yeah. Prices, I will tell you, prices kind of hit a peak about a year, year and a half ago. They haven't dropped, but they're not going up from there. We've kind of hit a ceiling, whether it's um, in, internal Keller Williams um, or it's internal Remax transactions, or it's um, we have Peerage and the Hanna family. I mean, the Hanna family up your way, you know, over, I don't know, years ago, bought both Realty USA and Nothnagel. Um, you have uh, Compass, you have uh, Douglas Elliman now, you have Rilogy, you have Berkshire Hathaway, all of these companies. Uh, and then there's some private equity companies interested in investing in brokerage companies. Yeah. Yep. And, and it's a very, very active market. Anybody else have any questions for Steve? Yep. I might as well have another one. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. <laughs> so if, um, you know, obviously you do evaluations for companies cause you've done that for me before and it was, always, yep. it was done very well. Thank you. And, and needed, by the way. Is there a basic formula that you would say based on gross profits of three times, 10 times, one time? Um, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot more factors <clears throat> than the real basicness of that, but. Um, we, we published, and by the way, um, let me give everybody my email address. It's S Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y at realtrends.com. S Murray at realtrends.com. And I give you that because we have a PDF version how valuing small to medium brokerage companies. It's a PDF. I'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. Just send me an email and I'll respond back and send that to you. Um, basically, brokerage companies that have 10 to 50 agents or up to 75 agents, perhaps, would be considered small to medium-sized brokerage companies. Generally, those companies, uh, the multiple of profit, to try to simplify it for everyone, and profit would generally be net income on your profit loss statement. The multiples would be two to three times the last 12 months. That would be the price or the value. It, the terms of how that's paid, far too complicated for me to go into in this call. But if you email me, it, it's in the book. Now, if you are 50, 75 agents up to 500 agents, that multiple of net income was probably more like three to four and a half today. Just to give you a general guideline. And there are a lot of, what's the right word? Um, just nuances to all the valuation and how to structure a deal. And let me share this. I think um, if you don't know this, the phone number here is 303-741-1500. Three zero three seven four one one thousand. The first call with us is always free. If you're working on something, you're acquiring another company, or somebody wants to buy you, and you'd like our advice and help, don't hesitate to email and call us. We're glad to help. 
uh, about half the time people call us for that, we can solve it in less than an hour's phone call, walk them through some things to know and do, and we're glad to do it. So, you know that the market is uh, the market is really active. I expect prices and terms. <clears throat> I expect them to start getting softer real fast. All those buyers are smart people, and they can see what's going on in housing sales. And my guess is those prices and terms are going to get softer soon. Okay. Anybody else have questions for Steve? Okay. Steve, I can't thank you enough. Yep. You're generous and kind in your offering to help. Um, and your knowledge is uh, unmatched. I thank well, you. I hope it was, I hope everybody got at least one or two useful thoughts out of the presentation. And if any, as I said, use the email or phone to follow up if we can help. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you all. Be safe. Be safe. See you, Steve. Thanks.